about a ministry of reconciliation. And uh, we have defined reconciliation as the restoration of a broken relationship to its former level of love and trust. Okay? The restoration of a broken relationship to its former level of love and trust. Um, and some will say, Pastor John, it can't ever be the same. In some respects, that's true. But you can love like you used to, you can trust like you used to, and sometimes it's even better. Okay? But you have to do something about it. It just doesn't happen. The process of reconciliation is that the offender has to confess and repent. The offended has to forgive and extend trust to the offender to rebuild it. Now, we're working around this scripture. This uh, Proverbs 28.13 is probably one of the more, more important scriptures that we have. He who covers his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them find mercy. Now let me, no let me note something to you. This is a proverb. Okay? This is not revelation in that sense. The revelation comes on, on who and how all the forgiveness takes place. Okay? But wisdom says that whoever who covers his sin doesn't prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Well, people who cover their sins are dishonest. They do it in a variety of ways, but fundamentally... They are dishonest um, in their lives and trying to either avoid consequences or uh, avoid humiliation or whatever. Confession, on the other hand, is clearly stating to the offended how one has violated the covenant between them and, without excuse, assuming responsibility for the consequences of their offense. Okay? Well... Uh, today, we want to talk about the second line in that, where we notice we said, he who covers his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them. Now notice it's not just a matter of confessing, it's a matter of renouncing. Um, and, uh, that's where people find mercy. Uh, that term, renounce, in the uh, uh, King James or the New Revised Standard Version is forsake. To forsake sin. Uh, uh, the whole, uh, all of these, that when we talk about renounce, forsake, whatever, are all synonyms for repentance. That's the term that we use uh, around church a lot. Um, and when we start talking about <coughs> repentance in Scripture, the idea is not simply a change of behavior. It is the total reorientation of one's thinking that leads to a behavior, to a change. You know, sometimes <laughs> one of the things that uh, will keep kids from touching a hot stove is touching a hot stove. <laughs> you, know, you learn to stay away from it. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't repent of it, they just don't want the consequences of it. But when we start talking about repentance, we're starting to talk about something that changes on the inside of us so that that, we wouldn't do it, that changes our behavior. Uh, the word itself means to change direction. You're walking in one way, and when you repent, you turn and you walk the other. You change direction. But it's not just a, a simple... Whatever, there's, there's something that changes with it. Um, John, uh, John the Baptist put it this way. Again, this is some scriptures that had some profound effects on my life. When John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now I want you to think about that image. A baptism of repentance. That term baptizo means to immerse, to dunk, to thoroughly submerge. And John came preaching a 
thorough immersion into repentance. Well, that's a, that's a whole lot different saying, sorry. Right? What we've got here is we are talking about being immersed, changed, different. We are different. And so when we start talking about uh, repentance, we're not talking about something that's just light and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. We're talking about some major upheavals in the way uh, we think and act. Now, let me tell you something, and, and I, I need to make this clear. Too often, we want to do this for sinners who come down the Sawdust Trail, and they come, and, and we all love the song. They baptized Jesse Taylor in Cripple Creek last Sunday. Uh, Devil got a, 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 Jesus now loves him, and the devil lost a good right, right man. We all, we all love it. The problem that happens is, is that we, as Christians, need to understand that periodically through life, we need to repent of some things. We need to change. We're going to grow in understanding. We're going to grow. Uh, and some things that we didn't think were hardly worth it, all of a sudden, we began to see them for the evil they really are, and we need to repent of them. Okay? Don't we, uh, same way, uh, in our relationships, there may be some ways that we have talked to our maid or treated our maid or done some things. All of a sudden, it dawns on you, that's not very nice. You know? I need to change. Okay? And, and so, we need to understand that repentance isn't just left for conversion. It will probably be a lifelong activity. Well, now, you're not going to be doing it every day. I mean, you know, come on, give me a break. But there are going to be times and periods where we're going to grow in grace, and we're going to need to repent. Notice what Jesus says. Now, that was John the Baptist. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. Repent and believe the gospel. And so Jesus is talking about repent and believe the gospel. Bottom line is... Salvation is conditioned on a faith that changes behavior. Yes, I am after easy believism right here. Well, if I just believe that Jesus died and rose again, I am saved. Really? The devils believe that. That's just believing a historical fact. When we take faith in Jesus Christ... We're going to live differently. Now, I don't know about you. I was 13 years old when I got saved. And you can say, well, 13 years old, what could you gotten into? Not enough, not much, but it was plenty. And it was sinful. And I can remember a time when it became very clear to me that if I died today, I was going to hell. 13 years old. You don't have to rob a bank. And what happens here is, is we've come to a point where we think if we believe a set of historical facts, we're saved. No. Faith in Jesus Christ means that you are going to change your behavior. Now, for example, James 2.17 says, uh, without faith, uh, faith without works is dead. Okay? I've got faith in Jesus Christ. Good. And why are you living like a devil? <laughs> Is this new or something? Or just a little close? <laughs> or John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Uh, he who does what is right is righteous, just as he, meaning Jesus, is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. I don't care if they claim to be a Christian. I don't care if they preach every Sunday. Oh, you're preaching to yourself, Pastor John? <laughs> yep. Come on. We've taken this idea of holy living way, way, way too uh, lightly. 
And so when we begin to have this faith in Jesus Christ, it changes our behavior. Amen. And, we, and Jesus said, well, we, we just got done singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And Jesus, I love the, uh, I love, I love the, the, the bumper sticker that says, If you love Jesus, don't honk, keep the commandments. <laughs> Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? Honk, honk. <laughs> What is repentance? Repentance is a change in behavior, specifically stopping offensive behavior and adopting loving behavior. Stop it! Amen. Quit! It. And, but it isn't just quitting, it means we replace it with other kinds of behavior. What's, what do you mean loving behavior, Pastor John? That's the term that I coined. It's behavior that is on the whole, in the best interest of the relationship, okay? You got this relationship and you're going to do what's best for it. Sometimes it means telling hard truths. Sometimes it means soothing words. Sometimes, but it's it, behavior that's intended for, in the best interest of the relationship and it intends only good for the parties involved. I'm tired of people who claim to be Christians and are mean. I, I've had it to hear. There's some people I go around, I don't go around, they claim to be Christians, but every time I go around them I get hurt. They can claim what they want. Okay? But we intend good. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, there have been times when I have intended good and, and uh, it backfired on me. We do that. That's being human. But our intentions are, anybody we come in contact with, we intend them good and not ill. Well, you don't know what they did to me. I don't care. Just because somebody else is uh, evil doesn't mean you have to be evil. Scripture says, uh, don't give evil for evil, but conquer evil with good. Amen. And the idea here when we start doing that is, is we only, we only want good. Only want good for everyone we come in contact. Boy, now there's a change in thinking, isn't it? Well, we have this church fight going on, and we tell the story in such a way it makes us look good and them look bad. Uh-oh. We're going to repent. We're going to tell it the way it is. And if we look bad, we look bad. And if they look bad, so be it. We're just going to tell the truth. five times every Sunday morning and never really think about it, do we? Let me make a couple observations. First of all, without a change of behavior, reconciliation cannot take place. And the, the reason is real simple. The offense will be repeated. Suppose I get down there at the bird. Walk up to him and whoa! Hit him right in the nose. Oh, Bert. Bert, I'm so sorry. You didn't provoke that. I, 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 I'm sorry. I hurt you. Will you forgive me? Bert, being the good Christian that he is, says, well, yes, Pastor John. And I step back and, whop, I hit him again. And he's really startled. And I say, oh, my. Bert, Bert, what an evil man I am. And to think of out of the cloth of all. Will you forgive me? Well, okay. <laughs> and I step up and wham, I hit him in the face again. Now he may forgive me, but he's not going to stop running to against the next county. <laughs> <laughs> the 
That's funny. What's not funny is when we start hurling insults and calling our mates names and, and uh, doing things that hurt them. But it's the same thing. Oh, I'm sorry. And I tell people, especially when it was a Christian school, kids say sorry. And I say, if you're sorry, you'll quit. If you're sorry, you'll quit. You see, just because we confess does not mean that reconciliation is going to happen. Behavior's got to change. You got to quit hurting people. People will not reconcile until they have a good reason to believe they will not be hurt again. That's the whole point of, re of reconciliation. Too many times the reason why our relationships aren't healed is that we're not sure that that person has quit hurting us. So reconciliation can't happen. You have to, uh, and sometimes it takes a while to convince people that you're not going to do it again. But the bottom line is, you've got to you've got to renounce it. You've got to forsake it. You've got to repent. Now, just a uh, playing the, the uh, for instance games. A change in behavior without confession may lead to healing, but it won't lead to reconciliation. The hurt's still there, and the fences haven't been mended. And too many times there are people who say, "Wow, that was mean. I, I'm never going to do that again." But they're too proud to confess. <coughs> and without confession and repentance, the, the people may heal, but the relationship will never go back together. <coughs> This brings us to something, another important scripture, Paul writing here, 2 Corinthians 7.10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Now I want you to notice there are two kinds of sorrow. We've got godly sorrow and we got worldly sorrow. What are they? Well, let's talk about worldly sorrow first. Worldly sorrow uh, will be sorry, and it will just uh, try and avoid to avoid the consequences, or you're just caught in the humiliation of being caught. Been a preacher for a long time. Craig's seen it. Get somebody, first time offender. Caught in jail, what's the first thing they ask for? The preacher. What's that? Oh, yeah. yeah. They ask for the preacher. <coughs> they want the preacher to come. No. And right there in that jail cell, they boo-hoo and cry and carry on and, and oh, I'm, you know, I should have been saved. And they want to get saved. Remember my, my pastor talking about a situation like that happening and they want the pastor to win and say, you know, well, they've gotten saved and, and whatever. Pastor Wilson was there in the court and the judge looked at him and he said, Pastor Wilson, um, you're a good man and I know things are there. He says, I want you to know I'm a hard man. And if they really got saved, they could live in jail. <laughs> Seriously. Because if you really got saved, you confessed what you did and you changed behavior and in your confession, you become willing to accept the consequences of your actions. In too many cases, what we have is people, they may claim to repent, but worldly sorrow, all it is, they're just sorry they got caught for whatever reason. What did it say that led to? Death. On the other hand, godly
really sorrowful is sorry that you ever did it. <coughs> Would to God I could go back. I'd do things differently. I'm sorry. Look at all the damage I did. Oh God, somehow overrule the damage that I did. <coughs> If I could go back, I'd do it again, or I'd, I'd change everything. I'm just sorry I did it. <laughs> this kind of does away with the idea. Of, they talk about young men like to go out and sow their wild oats and then pray for crop failure. <laughs> Godly sorrow is a change in mind. There's an angel with you on me. Oh, I guess not. How can you help? Well, you can be quiet. I swear, there's a demon. <laughs> Paul, in writing that scripture, actually verses 9 through 11, how he had confronted the Corinthians with their sin, and he said God, how, how that they had repented, and it, how much they cleared themselves. There's a clearing that takes place with, with godly sorrow. And so what we want to do is we want to, we want to understand <coughs> that godly sorrow starts with a change of mind about the action itself and a vow to never do it again and to make it as right as we possibly can. Repentance. Let me see if I can do this. <clears throat> I land. I love what David Augsburger has to say. Right actions for the future are the only true apologies for wrong answers in the past. Right actions in the future are the only true apologies for wrong answers in the past. Amen? Amen. You need to understand that. Brothers and sisters, when relationships are broken, the offender must confess and change their behavior. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, all of us get the opportunity to do it. But also point out to you, as I did in the sermon, that salvation, we begin to think, coming to Jesus Christ, means that we come to Him confessing our sin and changing our behavior. Right? You need to keep that in mind. Too much easy believism running around. People think they're Christians just because they believe Jesus lived, died, and rose again. Devils believe that. Has to make a change in our behavior. Has to make a change in our behavior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne,